<laughs> hey, that's your computer, not mine. That's not, you could draw. You could do whatever you want to your computer. It's not mine. It's not my computer. It's somebody else's computer. Sure. So but, hello, uh, all. Uh, uh, yeah. Well. Uh. So hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Neil Gompa, and this is David Duncan, and we're here to talk to you about Fedora Cloud KDE. Um, this is a bit about all the stuff we kind of do and things. Uh, most important thing is I do a lot in Fedora. I do a lot in KDE. I do a lot in, in CentOS and other places. David here does a lot in Fedora, and he does stuff uh, for the cloud. And we're here to try to show you what we're trying to do together. I buddy up with Neil a lot, honestly. <laughs> But uh, that's that's uh, that's because he's a, he's a great mentor and super super helper. So we've I've learned a whole lot in the context of the things, part, partly some of the things that we're going to talk about today, and then also uh, just generally about Fedora and and uh, and you know it's been a, a great experience for us to just work together on many th many things. Exactly. Yeah. So we first want to talk a little bit about desktops in the cloud. The thing about you know virtual desktop infrastructure is it's been kind of uh, a holy grail of sorts for gosh I don't know like decades at this point people people have been wanting to have to eliminate hardware at the edge for as long as it's been possible to have computers connected to each other in the network because in the very beginning you didn't have hardware at the edge you had these thin terminals dumb clients whatever you want to call them and then they would go and speak to like some kind of mainframe or supercomputer or whatever. In, in the current era, now computers do stuff, but the problem of people breaking stuff is also still true. And so they'd like to have a way to do, do desktop computers without the computer part uh, at, 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 the, at the desktop. So, the, uh, and, and part of the reason this came up uh, as something that we thought was super interesting to do is because... You might want to talk closer to the microphone. Oh, yeah, sorry. So one of the things that we thought this was this was super interesting to do is is um, uh, I was I was having a conversation just just sort of a casual conversation around uh, use of desktops and and uh, and uh, in in graphics intensive workloads right like film and animation and I was having a conversation uh, with someone around like an architect around this uh, who was responsible for a fairly major uh, uh, customer Red Hat customer. And and uh, uh, what our like it was pretty animated, right? And I got somebody from from uh, from uh, uh, our media and entertainment group and Amazon to talk to these talk to them, and I just listened, right? And I thought, <clears throat> you know, there's a bunch of free stuff out there that we could use to do exactly what's going on <laughs> in in these you know in this multi-million dollar solution, and. Uh, the first opportunity I had to talk about it was to talk about it in the context of, of, of the rail workstation. And so rail workstation became one of those things that I was like, we've got to beat down the doors and have this available for anybody who's, you know, who's doing graphics, in, graphics intensive workloads and wants to see how this works. And, um, and it's a thing now. It is a thing now. Yeah, it's very exciting to me is we have... And, and uh, uh, you know, obviously crafting something like that was really uh, interesting because... Um, we had to craft it in a way that didn't um, create a cannibalized uh, workload for server. Uh, just generally in the cloud, right? You can you, you if you run anything anywhere, um, you just run the cheapest one, right? <clears throat> so we wanted to make sure that people were using this for a specific type of workload, which was single purpose, right? You want to have one or two users for a rail workstation. You want them to have task specific workloads that are that are uh, that are user centric. And uh, other than that, you know, the, the, the functionality of the bits is kind of the same. And so we wanted to, to make sure that we had, you know, the right, the right kind of business objectives around that. And it led to creating this like, big screen around like, what, what, the, what, our, what our market model would be and, then, and how, we would, you know, how we would price that. And, and, um, and again, with all of this, uh, there, there are. Where's the open yeah. source product? Yeah, where is the open source product to go with it? And and where you know how do you how do you create an upstream for that kind of an experience? And 
Neil and I thought about it, and we thought, you know, this is the way we can we can actually make this happen. Yeah, and then from a community perspective, there were a number of people had approached me over the years, asking about being able to do some of these kinds of things for much more prosaic use cases. You know, thinking about things like, well, in libraries, they want to have thin client uh, terminals because the computers need to be cheap because the kids are going to break them, uh, and they'd like to not have to spend thousands of dollars to replace the broken computers. Uh, and in schools where they want to do something a little bit more powerful, but they don't want to really expose them to the hardware because, you know, in, in labs and whatever, they're usually using Chromebooks. And Chromebooks are not powerful enough to do certain types of things. But, you know, you still want to teach them in real environments. And then we kind of get to environments that are a little bit more interesting and special, and that's developing in the cloud for the cloud, right? So um, a lot uh, in the past 10 years, we've started to see a larger shift towards developer experiences tending away from Windows and Mac OS, surprisingly, towards Linux. Um, as of last year, the Stack Overflow survey shows um, Mac OS and Linux basically neck and neck um, with them trading blows like year over year. And I think this year, I, I, um, Linux actually surpassed Mac OS in terms of developer preference. And one of the, the bigger challenges that's around doing a lot of the developer type stuff uh, for cloud applications is that the best developer experience always requires a whole bunch of like tools that you run locally in your environment, integrated with your IDE and things like that. Even the best web IDs, and there's a lot of good ones, like uh, especially like you know Dev Workspaces and OpenShift and stuff like that, and Cloud9 yeah. and AWS. Right, they, yeah. they provide a lot of <laughs> capabilities and interesting possibility, but nobody's building like in the community space. Nobody's really building tools for that. They're building them for your computer because that's the stuff they're interacting with, and we got to bring that kind of experience into the cloud as well, especially if you're maybe in an emergency situation or far away, or God forbid you have to work from your phone. Or an intern. Or an intern, <laughs> or an intern, or a contractor. There's a litany of reasons why you'd want to be able to do this, and we wanted to be able to do this with Linux because there aren't anybody, there isn't anybody really doing it with Linux. And it seems like a big opportunity, which, is, which kind of leads into why are we doing Fedora KDE for the cloud? Well, because Fedora KDE SIG, which is you know, the SIG I chair, um, we maintain the KDE stack and we have a great relationship with the upstream KDE community uh, to be able to provide an excellent experience with that stuff. And as part of being able to provide that excellent experience, we provide the fresh KDE software as upstream is releasing it and we collaborate with them to enable features and, and capabilities that we feel our users um, for our various targeted audiences would actually benefit from. And that kind of leads to, you know, yeah. you want to talk about well, kind of artifact to, stuff? Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, our excitement today was that we wanted to, we wanted to demo this, but uh, there was a rollback that uh, eliminated the Wayland support. And so we are, uh, we are, we are left yeah. without Wayland support and with a requirement for XR utils. Um, which also doesn't exist. Which also in doesn't exist in Fedora. And uh, so, but what we did do was to create a series of playbooks and, uh, and configuration um, that would provide a lockdown desktop for, uh, for support, right? So now you can actually create the, the, um, the KDE configuration on top of a Fedora cloud-based image. That Fedora cloud-based image then can be used uh, with a security group. There's a security group that's created and that security group locks you to wherever it is that you started that um, that instance uh, from. So like I started one today and created it in my account and I have a single IP address that is associated with the, the hotel that's, um, or whatever the hotel network looks like for real, I don't know. <laughs> but the, um, uh, but the, the, uh, the uh, and that you know prevents you from having um, something that's just wide open to the rest of the world. That locks us down to a specific client now, the client that we use is one that, uh, so it's what I know, right? <laughs> so Nice DCV is, a, is the client, and, and that's what we were excited about using. Nice DCV happens to be free for use on top of AWS, and the reason we wanted that, that uh, experience was because it is free, right? And the, the, the excitement for us was that that works in the context of, um, of the... GPU-based instances, which we can support on, on uh, Fedora, and it also works on just general hardware. So if you have something that's like a smaller, a smaller workload or you want to do, some, you want to do an experiment and uh, you know, roll something, maybe you want to roll something in KDE, I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
Like you could also just, you know, one of those things is like maybe you are prototyping mm -hmm. a new lab environment for, for some kids in a, in a school that you want to have an, an instance up to like see how that's going to work and make sure everything's good. You could yeah. do it at a small gen pop instance, make sure everything's going to be great, then save it. And then, you know, when you're rolling it out for real, you could roll it out in the right kind of configuration that would yeah. be needed to support it for the kids. Right. Exactly. And uh, I mean, I know we're all constrained to like lots of security requirements and um, anybody who's in the security team, in a security team of sorts here, you have my condolences. I know how hard your campaign, campaign requirements are and everybody wants you to produce results um, uh, even when there's not a security bug. <laughs> so, Especially when there's not a security bug. <laughs> there's not one. So uh, we run into, I run into this a lot in my, in, you know, in Dollar Day job where I have an instance that's running, it's not optimized, everybody knows it's not optimized, and they know that I'm running it at, you know, whatever, 3% of its actual, op, you know, optimized use, use model. And so just very quickly creating a, a machine image from that and then snapping it, making it possible for me to just start it over again um, from an S3 snapshot makes it a lot cheaper and uh, decreases the security profile to something that people can live with. Um, hopefully. <clears throat> yeah, hopefully. <clears throat> so... Those are if if I encrypt the snapshot. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. So, so the um, the the goal here was to create something that was super simple, and we could we could just get uh, we could just get to the next step. So we're doing the install on the nice DCV, uh, but we'll have to we'll have to uh, rev that once uh, once we get the code for the the Wayland support. Right, mm -hmm. and the idea here like is to demonstrate. This was intended to be a prototype to show. You can take the Fedora cloud base, you can la stack on a desktop, do some minor configuration tweaks, and suddenly you have a cloud desktop. Um, Which we, you we, were, we almost were there. Yeah, and then, well, Neil's working on something else, though. Right, and so that's part of the future features part of this. So some of the things I've been having a conversation in the background with um, KDE folks upstream is the idea around headless KDE Plasma. Now, uh, if you... You may have not seen my talk at Academy, so I'll kind of quickly recap something that I talked about there when I was talking about um, Fedora KDE, is that for KDE 6 in Fedora, we are only shipping a Wayland environment. No X11 session, all that stuff's gone. X11 applications will of course work in the Plasma Wayland session, but we're not doing X11 for KDE Plasma 6.0. Um, upstream KDE will have the ability to be built to support an X11 session, but we're not shipping that in Fedora. Um, on top of that, uh, there's been some efforts upstream in, uh, in KDE to develop uh, a way for Quinn, the compositor, Kwin, uh, to have a headless mode that can then be backed by RDP to use as the, the old ultimate um, head for running the Plasma desktop. So then we can use RDP and have a fully free stack for being able to do a virtual desktop from the cloud to anywhere, and this will give us all kinds of other capabilities, but the most important part, because it's fully open and generic, we can have this in any and every cloud, rather than being specific in yeah. this case with the prototype with AWS's nice DCV. Um, I mean, you can use it anywhere, but the, but the yeah. thing is, is that it's, not, it's, free, it's free when you use it on the platform. Yeah, um, <laughs> but more importantly, because it's all open source, you can kind of see how everything works, you can figure it out, you can improve it, you can learn from it, and you can build on top of it. And that's, that's the key aspect that we want to do with the Fedora Cloud KDE, and, and we're kind of targeting this to be something that we can start really building out um, when we land Plasma 6 within Fedora and, and start working on that headless uh, Plasma mode. Yeah, and, and this is like something that kind of dovetails with some of the other things that I think are really amazing, like the Linux system roles, um, making it possible for you to just find a way to, to you know, apply this in a, in a way that is kind of generic. Yeah, and so if you're interested in this kind of stuff, like in addition to the Fedora Cloud SIG and working group that's working on this, right, the Fedora KDE SIG is, is actively working with the Cloud Working Group on this front, you can okay. see our lovely members that are in there and all the avenues in which you can come talk to us. We're on Matrix, we have a mailing list, we have an issue tracker. Come and, and join in the fun if you're interested in this topic. Um, so any questions? Yeah, awesome. And this is why we finish with five minutes to spare. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. And I'm an Avid KD user mm. in Fedora, but as an Avid KD user, uh, my question really was from the start, why KDE in this case? I love KDE, yeah. uh, but it's one of the most resource-heavy 
uh, desktop environments out there and in the cloud you pay for resources. So if it's a a AWS, that means you pay more, while uh, the scenario I would be really interesting, deploying on a VPS, uh, when you have like four gigabytes of RAM, what KDE can you think of? Uh, so my question is, how much of this work <coughs> can be applied uh, to a lightweight environment like IceWM, like what we used to use 10 years ago? And uh, what's the rationale for using a heavyweight environment like KDE in the cloud? So uh, let me pick apart a couple of things here. So the first is the thought that KDE Plasma is the heaviest environment, uh, or one of the heaviest. Um, no, it, it actually isn't anymore, especially when you're running in the Wayland mode. Mm -hmm. um, the, the minimum KDE setup, which is just the desktop, shell, compositor, and you don't have the KDE PIM services, which you don't need in the cloud environment anyway. So, those yeah, out. <laughs> so if you take all those out, um, your KDE Plasma desktop runs with 120 megs of RAM. And that is basically comparable to LXQt, uh, XFCE, um, Mate, with the added advantage of actually being fully actively maintained and having Wayland support and supporting all these kinds of new features, being able to be hardware accelerated optionally through um, things like the uh, cloud-based uh, GPUs and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, the second aspect of this is most of the stuff that we're trying to do will probably not work on your average um, X11-based environment because the idea is that we're trying to leverage modern protocols that are network efficient for uh, being able to make it so that it's responsive over the over the internet. So like the usage of RDP uh, as an efficient transport and communications mechanism for the desktop has basically not been successfully done in a reasonably performant fashion with anything backed by an X11 server. But with the Wayland server, you're able, we're able to cut out a lot of this fat and have a very optimized method of handling this at the compositor level, at the, at the renderer level. And so that's why this is able to be done. And you'd be surprised that how much less resources you have when you also don't have to figure out hardware quirks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. This is clear. Maybe there is a trade war, a trade off on the cloud resources, but of course, network resources, which are actually often the ones yeah. that. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, and remember that one of the things that we're taking advantage of is, is we're taking. Oh. Yeah, one of the things we're taking advantage of is that you're not going to use this all day, right? You're going to use it for task-specific workloads, and then you're going to put it away and, and go do something on another, another system. So you can start, stop it all day. That means you're paying for the store, the monthly, like you're, in this context, you're paying for monthly storage for the volume, but then the compute power, which is your actual, your, your, your heaviest cost, you're, you're using it opportunistically, right? <clears throat> There is nothing that would stop once we have the final version, which is generic, that would stop it from being used in a traditional in, in a in a virtual provider cloud system like say Linode or 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 similar. Yeah. Those are those are totally possible to do. Like the main constraint is making sure that your I/O and network performance are high enough in the environment that you're running in that this doesn't like choke. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think the 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 thing that you know, the, in the context of, of what we've done here, we have one deployment script for the, for the instance that's created, right? And you can make some modifications in your extra, extra arguments, right? But you don't, but effectively, there's just a, a super simple way to do it. We can make many, right? So then the question becomes, how do we do that? You know, what's our, what's our easiest path forward to doing the provisioning? And the provisioning itself is the, is the one thing that we would focus on. Okay, uh, I have a question about the keyboard, and uh, I always have a problem with oh things boy. like key shortcuts. You you know, Control Alt F1 and or F2 whatever, and your session is gone. And how does it look here? So, I mean, I can give you that answer. You want to give it? Yeah, go for it. So, so there's so there's going to be there's going to be two parts. One is going to be based on the client. And the client itself uh, will allow you to, to grab the whole keyboard, right? So the client that we're using in this context gives you that whole keyboard. 
the RDP, the KRDP will also give you right. access to the whole So board, if you're using the KRDC client, that is the client side of RDP from KDE, mm -hmm. there's an option in it to make it so that it grabs the whole keyboard and intercepts all actions before passing it on to the host. And so you can use control, special characters, all the fun stuff, or you know, Alt GR and doing third, fourth, fifth level modifiers, whatever crazy thing you need to do. Um, it'll it'll pass it forward to to the to the virtual to the remote session. Yeah, you were in my previous talk where I talked about my love of Emacs, but I am a key cord maker. <laughs> okay. uh, he really is. Yeah. Uh, okay. And why did you use Ansible instead of Terraform? Uh, so I know that because Terraform is like you know the basic, like the most I... basic tool, and changing from one provider to another is quite simple. Uh, well, well, I think it's I think it's super simple, I, right? But um, but Ansible, you know, just like falls into the family, right? So I feel like there's there's yeah. also the other part of it of like the only thing Terraform would actually do is make the cloud-based instance. Yeah, and you then, still need to do everything else somewhere yeah. else, and that would be done in Ansible. So if you're only doing one step in Terraform and all the other steps in Ansible, and the one step is trivial, you might as well do the one step in Ansible too. Yeah. And, and then uh, on top of that, one of the things that I mentioned was the concept of the Linux system role. So the, the concept around the Linux system role has been something that I've, that's entertained me for a long time. And, and thinking about how we can have those in, in the context of Fedora Cloud is something that I think uh, is beneficial. Right. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, I, w I was l really looking forward for the demo, so, so I'm pretty sad. That me that too. Is. So are we. <laughs> so, so can, can, you, can you later post something on the Mastodon? Uh, I would love to watch that because honestly, yeah. I will probably not uh, run the playbook. Uh, I will have no time for that. I understand. So, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think what, so the answer to that is, I talked to Paolo, I talked to the GM for the product and was like, hey, we're not, we don't see the Wayland support. And he was like, oh, I'll have to get you the, you know, the, yeah. the review code. And, and, um, and so as soon as we can, as soon as we can post it out, <clears throat> we'll uh, we'll we'll just make a, a movie on the on the GitHub repository on the readme. And and the second question, so so what's what's the feature where I can expect something uh, super easy like like Linux Media Writer or something which I just click and got it in the cloud uh, or AMI? Yeah. In, in so the goal is that once we have the generic version, we actually are going to produce a layered image uh, product. Or, or variant or whatever you want to call it, yeah. layered product, uh, layered, layered spin uh, on top of the Fedora cloud based edition yeah. that you... we can ship and give AMI launch buttons and give them steps to like how do you connect to it automatically and all that other fun stuff. Yeah. You... At a, so so when, when approximately? I would be very hesitant to give dates yeah. because I don't actually know when yeah. Plasma 6 my, is going to release. Guess, yeah, my guess is, is uh, let's, let's wait until Paolo uh, tells me that the Wayland code is, is ready for the, for the client. Yeah. And then if the KRD, KRDP is, is ready, then that's the one we'll, we'll choose because we want one that's just functional everywhere. Right. And, and like KD, the KD community is estimating, has been estimating like we're looking at seeing first Plasma 6 release by the end of the year, early, early next year. So if everything optimistically works out, I'd like to have a preview build that's, that we, we start making available in Fedora as a generic image in the summer, maybe, and, and, or maybe in the fall, and then and kind of go from there. <laughs> Summer of next year, Adam Williamson. We, we don't make forward-looking statements, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, quick question. So, KeyRDP is an RDP server, right? That's correct. Yeah, KRDP is a new library that the KD uh, one of the KDE folks has been making to encapsulate all the functions of creating an RDP server to plug in as part of a backend for Plasma Desktop. It's not as lightweight as the, mm. you know, so it's a protocol that we can adhere, adhere to and make Yeah, but easier. here's the question. Is there an architecture diagram how it plugs into SSSD for authentication, for example? Uh, That'd be kind of awesome. I yeah, mean, I think I we're going to have to have a conversation yeah. with, uh, <laughs> yeah. with AB about that. Yeah. yeah. Now, there, there's some other stuff that we have to figure out, like having, having the ability to render through RDP is only the first step. We have to also figure out authentication and all this other stuff. And that's why I'm saying, like, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers for being able to do a preview um, next summer, but I, I genuinely don't know, like, uh, what it's going to take to get us to a point where this is something that I'd be comfortable with, say, 
this is a generally useful thing that you can kind of sort of maybe rely on building your own versions of to then roll oh, out okay. for your own thingies and then somebody might want to do something more interesting with it down the road. No, no, yeah, that's right. Oh, wait, I'm but at, at the moment, uh, so you spawn a VM, uh, it, it, it runs key RDP, uh, but how the actual authentication of the user session happens? Well, right now we would be auto logging. Yeah. So uh, we uh, don't we don't have a better way of dealing with this right so now. So there, there is simply no, no way to protect the VM from uh, unauthorized well, connections. Okay. So the nice DCV actually contains a client we can create base logins on the on the box. And, and the RDP itself also supports handling user password logins as well as Kerberos logins. And but we have to hook yeah. all that stuff up. Yeah, yeah. The plumbing the plumbing for that would be like second second generation. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. None of this stuff is simple. Yeah. <laughs> But I like your I like where you're going. There are other things there are other things that are awesome about that, like the SSSD implementation with like uh, instance connect uh, models from different public clouds would be really cool. And that and that would actually be super nice because then we can plug it in through PAM back into SDDM and then verify and authenticate the login session automatically through your yeah. local credentials. I think I've got like a 700 day old Bugzilla with, <laughs> with Amy Farley about some of the things that we could do there. Actually, Amy's probably moved on. So yeah, so yeah, I don't know who would be doing it now. <laughs> but iPads will be way more useful now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right.